<laughs> well, Monday morning, back from Texas, and uh, got back Saturday night, but it's a uh, it's a little bit of drive from the airport anyway, and it had snowed, so had to do the what's usually a hour drive at 70 miles an hour I had to do at 40 miles an hour so it was it was after midnight when I finally got got home <coughs> then spent the next day really kind of just <laughs> laying around partially because it was a Sunday and partially because I was wore out traveling you know it's one of those things that you spend all day doing nothing and don't realize how tired that makes you. <clears throat> so got a chance to, you know, I'd been talking about what the things I was going to be looking for and things I was going to be looking at. And, you know, I had this big, big master scheme to, in the evenings, turn this thing on and talk about what I'd seen and what I'd done. You said the guns broke that panel. Uh, but things don't always work out the way you plan for them to. So it's better to reflect on it all now. Um, one of the major, major things that was on my mind that I wanted to see was, was the layout of the place, how things were set up and uh, how things were were done or could be done around there. The uh, It rained an inch and a half the night before I got there. And uh, that I was actually glad of that. You know, if I was living there and working there, that inch and a half of rain would have made me crabby because I don't like the mud. But uh, I was actually glad of that for this particular deal because it gave me an opportunity to see what it was like after an inch and a half around. Um, and uh, of course it was muddy, but it, it wasn't like unreasonably flooded. It wasn't like wasn't like you couldn't accomplish anything on account of it. Um, and so that's that's a good thing to, to find out. Um, it was a situation where it appeared like the the arena would probably be out of commission for several days because it had standing water in it. Um, and that is something that actually the oh, the owner and I had had talked about before I even went down there that he wanted to haul a bunch of sand in that arena because it because it held water. Uh, but the footing in the round pen was still really really good, even with that, and it would have been could have been. A deal where, uh, well, we don't get to use the arena for a couple of days, but there's still, there's still outside country guy can ride in there, and it, it wouldn't have been a deal where you were just out of work for three or four days. So that was a good thing to find out. And uh, as, in terms of the setup, you know, nothing's. You never find a perfect one. And the spot where I'm at right now is, in terms of efficiency and for what I do, is is uh, like really, really good. But if a guy was trying to do, do other things, it wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily work real good. Uh, you know? If a guy was trying to run a show horse barn, this, this deal would be a little tough. 
Uh, if a guy was wanting to train rain and horses, you know, the arena's not big enough, things like that. So each place has their, has their good qualities and their bad qualities. Um, that place I looked at there got a really big barn, nice big barn. 24 stalls, all really well made. Um, everything's solid sided, wood paneled. Nice barn, darn, darn nice barn. Uh, the downside was that I could see anyway. Yes, sir wasn't any windows in a metal building in southeast southwest Texas so I'll bet that son of a gun gets hot so that'd be a thing that I'd I'd want an issue I'd want to address um, the round pen was you know of course since Colts is my main deal Round pen, that's my office, and so that's a, a major issue. It wasn't so far away from the rest of the stuff as to make things, um, you know, to where you'd just be wasting so much time going back and forth. It wasn't so far away, but it wasn't directly attached, like to, to the barn or to the arena or anything like that either. So there was, it'd be a little bit prohibitive. Um, what I did like about the round pen was it was big, solid sided, good footing, uh, had three different gates and one of the gates opened up into a, uh, not real long, but a relatively wide, long alley. So a guy could, uh, you know, take a colt that was ready for a little more room and Go bounce around through that alley a little bit. Uh, so I like that. The arena is huge, huge arena. Nice set of open pan or open boxes and so on and so forth. Um, the return alley for the open boxes is built in such a way where it'd be really, really good for trot colts up and down there. You know, as kind of a transition between the round pen in the arena proper. If you weren't quite confident that you had a woe on him. Uh, so that was that was a good thing. Um, it was also set up in a way where a guy could catch all these colts first thing in the morning, have them tied out, and uh, you know, tie a whole bunch of them out and then ride them, give them bath time back up, ride them, give them bath time back up, so on and so on, which is kind of labor intensive, but for me, with those young horses, I've always found that works a lot better. You know, I like doing that. I like catching and saddling a whole raft of them first thing in the morning, you know. And then, and then leaving those colts tied. It works good. And uh, like I said, you know, so, so no place is perfect. So this little deal where I'm at here is set up so handy and so efficient, but it's not set up in a way where I can catch everything, saddle them, leave them tied, and then uh, tie everything when I'm done. What's your deal? You got a weekend off now? I can't catch you, huh? Wild son of a gun. So those were some some good things I saw about the place. Um, what I saw that was important was that there wasn't anything where I where I uh, went, oh no, this absolutely will not work at all, and have that be be like like the heartbeat of of the operation be something that I absolutely wouldn't stand for. So there was nothing like that. Uh, there's some room for some tinkering. And you know, there always is. And, and one of the other things I talked about is uh, 
if there is if there is some changes that need made is the owner willing to to let that happen and this guy's really really open-minded <coughs> so that i didn't don't foresee that being any kind of problem um, if a, if a guy did want to change some stuff around which inevitably you you do want to and that's why i said you know some of these older places are are so funny because so many things have been changed over the years because that's that's just how life works i get changed back and forth round and round uh i did talk about that a little bit before I, you know, said I didn't know if it was an old place, new place, what kind of place. Uh, it's basically brand new. It's uh, it's uh, sounds like it's maybe like five years old, and uh, built from built from scratch. wasn't any rebuilding or anything. Just started out as a bare piece of ground, and uh, the guy built what he what he wanted to start with. So that's actually, you know, there's there's some really cool parts about that too. Is that for one, everything's new. Somebody knows where all the all the uh, <laughs> water lines and stuff are, and and that sounds funny. But like for instance, at the K four, if there was a water leak, that place was so old that nobody necessarily knew where everything, where where to even turn off the water, um, uh, because they they just they just. Uh, you know, put in another one over top of the old one, things like that. So, uh, this place is new. It's, uh, it's, it's not even, you know, a guy wouldn't really even call it totally finished. There's, there's some things that still need done to it. So, uh, those were all good, all good things. Um, so another thing I was curious about was, was of course the mare lines. I'm not in love with them. I won't necessarily talk about what they what they are, but um, I'm not really in love with the mare lines. I understand the thought process that they were going through was that um, a lot of these modern cutting horses are are getting really, really, really small and don't have very much foot and uh you know there was a time where i where i said oh you know shoot doesn't matter they're they're big enough to go do do a job and for a lot of cases they are but honestly some of them are getting just way too small <clears throat> and the thing is, is even even if individually myself or anybody else thinks you know that, that horse is still big enough to do a job uh if you're trying to sell horses to the public which is what this operation is based on then uh you, you know you can't convince the whole rest of the world but nah he's still big enough to rope a cow on whether he is or isn't so um I understand where the thought process is there on the mare line, trying to have some size involved, and then you know have the cattiness and trainability of the of the modern horse. Um, like I said before, it it hardly ever works out the way a guy hopes it does. You know, have the size and durability. A more foundation bred horse with the reins and athleticism of a modern horse um, doesn't usually seem to work. Oh, mama. But the good thing is, is they didn't go, they haven't gone so far out. Um, you know, haven't gone like all blue valentine mares on these modern studs to try to to try to build the medium ranch horse they, they haven't haven't done that so um, 
wasn't a set of mares I was in love with, but not a bad set of mares. And uh, there again, the guy that owns the place is really open-minded about the fact that he wants to hire a horseman because he's not necessarily. Uh, you know, he's, he's a guy that really likes horses and really loves horses, but hasn't spent his whole life horseback studying them, trying to figure them out, you know, <laughs> basically taking a vow of poverty for their sake. So, uh, it, it was a deal where he was, he's open-minded about changing mare genetics and tinkering with that. So that was that was a good thing to see. Um, I guess I'll. I don't. I, I don't know that I knew, so I probably didn't talk about it earlier what the what the mission of the whole horse program there is. And to be honest with you, I still kind of don't know because. They kind of don't know. Um, that was, I guess, another one of the <laughs> job requirements was that somebody with a mission to come up with a mission. What what they do want to do is they, they want to raise and sell nice horses. Okay, well, that's great. And that's, that's what everybody says. You know, well, I just want to raise and sell nice horses. Well, it's not quite as easy as that. Uh, that you have to you have to have a plan to get your horses noticed and and to get them to get them sold and just raising a really nice horse isn't enough uh, you know or, or medium of the road road, road like it it's not a, if you build it they will come kind of a deal <coughs> so that son of a gun already untied himself. He's fixing to go cause trouble if he can. He's done this enough now, he's figured out how to walk while dragging lead rope without stepping on it. <clears throat> anyway, if you weren't such a grouchy son of a gun, I wouldn't catch you and tie you up first thing in the morning. Ooh. Just a little trick there. If you've got a horse that's loose with a lead rope, watch where they're stepping. And when they do step on that lead rope, say, whoa. And a lot of times, that'll convince them that you've got them. A little trick I learned from Mark Hawkinsmith. <coughs> anyway, back to the program, scheduled programming. Uh, the mission of the place, like I said, they they don't they they think they have a mission. You know, we just want to raise nice horses and sell them. Okay, well, there's more to it than that, and so um, that's something that that we talked about that needs addressed. How are we going to market these horses? What age do we want to sell them? This, that, and the other. Um, so the place in terms of the necessity of horses in and of itself, they've got all they need for the ranching purposes, for the, for the actual cow ranch part of it. They've got really all they need. And uh, they've got way more of a horse program than they need to just have that be sustainable. So they are at a point right now where they do have a surplus of horse flesh and very soon we'll have a huge surplus of horse flesh. And what they do, what those guys do, is uh, get together and team rope in the evenings in the afternoons and so they like to take and 
take some of these younger horses, you know, three and four year olds, and, and use them on on the ranch there. Um, you've heard me talk disparagingly at times about using those younger horses on the ranch, and you know that's when I was on ranches that were. hundreds of thousands of acres um, this part of Texas a, a huge ranch around there is 80,000 acres and uh, and it's so brushy and stuff in that part of the world it's it's not like you're hitting long trot at 7 in the morning and staying there all day um, so it is a place where where a guy can use a three-year-old that day and not have it be too much for him and then at the end of the day go to the go to the roping pen and, and uh, you know track the lead steer a little bit this and that and then as time goes on start coming out of the box <coughs> so at this point that's kind of what they what they're doing is getting those colts started they're sending them all out to get started uh, you know getting 120 days on them with uh, actually they're sending them to these bigger name cow horse trainers because the the owner he he just likes how the the cow horse deal works um, not that he's necessarily trying to raise a cow horse or be a cow horse guy, <clears throat> but he, he likes that they're a lot broker than, for instance, a cutter. That, that's, you know, those those cutting horses, they cut, but a lot of them never loped a circle. So he's uh, he sent them to the cow horse guys, getting 120 days on them, and at that point he and his cowboys can use them and then uh, gradually start team roping a little bit on them and uh and from there raise a you know get horse or it's four or five years old five six years old and uh try to market them as, as team roping horses and so far at this point their their deal has just been by hook or by crook you know go to some jackpots with them and sell horses to some friends so that's it's definitely something that needs to be addressed uh, and there needs to be a, a marketing plan and, and a plan for all these horses um, in terms of of the ranch and the personnel that place isn't big enough nor does it have enough people that are that are good with a horse to continue on with, with that deal of of use them on the ranch a little bit and make make a rope horse out of them and and then sell them as we go. Um, you know, they'll just be able to run with them in no time. And he knows that. The owner knows that. Um, you know, so there there needs to be a marketing plan for for the for the rest of the horses. And it's a deal where, yeah, we can continue on with that in for you know forever and ever with three, four, five, six head a year. Uh, but the rest of them there needs to be planned for. So those are some some things we talked about. Um, He's real inclined on on selling a good portion of them as yearlings. Um, in some of these sales that have incentives, uh, for instance, and this is just off the top of my head, uh, the horse sale in Clovis, New Mexico. You buy those colts as a yearling. You have to buy them as yearlings. You buy them as a yearling, and then you pay into the incentive program. And then, as three-year-olds, they have a show, and it's. Uh, you know, like a like a ranch horse class, I guess is what they call it, um, where you you work a cow, you do a rain and dry pattern, uh, you rope something. There's maybe a trail course with it too. I don't recall. And uh, and then at the end, you have the option. You can sell your horse if you want. You don't have to sell your horse. But the the added money to it. Last time I knew anything about it, and it's been some years ago. Last time I knew anything. Uh, it was like twenty thousand added, and so it's it's that much or more now. Uh, 
you know, so there's a lot of incentive to buy a horse, make a nice horse. So there's several of those in the country, those kind of sales. Uh, he wants to focus a lot of the, a lot of the, a uh, lot of the program on sending horses to those yearling incentive programs, uh, at least for a few years until, um, until he's kind of built a brand uh, to where, you know, people go out of their way to, to come find one of these horses. Not because it's in an incentive program, just because they're darn nice horses and, and uh, you know, that's where you go to get one. Um, so that's that's a good plan for a short-term, short-term goal. Um, and that's probably where we're, st- where we're gonna start. And I'll talk about that yearling thing there for a second. Um, before I go on, it's just something I wanted to, to add that, that I thought was really smart. Like I said, this program's real young. Uh, three, four year old program is all it is. They haven't been raising horses for very long. One thing they've done that's extremely smart is up until now, uh, they've reta- retained ownership on everything until they were broke and, and darn sure had a job and were doing things um, because they wanted to know what they had what they were breeding uh so you know that was specifically to to figure out what cross is not to make this stud doesn't match up with this mare does with this mare da 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 da. you know this mare doesn't she doesn't throw anything any good at anything let's get rid of her etc etc so that's been extremely wise on their part that they've uh, retained ownership until they kind of could do some tweaking and figure out if they were raising what they wanted to or not uh but at this point they feel like they've got a, enough of a handle on that for now that they can they can start selling these as babies. <clears throat> so I'll go into that selling them as babies deal. Sounds like the easiest thing in the world the way I just just said it. You know, you selling them in these yearling sales that have have incentives and. Uh, you know, that's all you got to do is sell them. And some of these, uh, you know, like the Ruby buckle and the Riata buckle and stuff like that, you have to either win your way into or earn your way into their incentive programs. Um, I just say win your way into or earn your way into win your way into or buy your way into the program uh these these guys have done a smart thing and and bought into to those bigger incentives like the ruby buckle and so on um but anyway you know one one like clothes for instance i keep bringing that one up just because i know i know the program real well because i know steve friskip real well and and uh, just using it as an example Clovis, you don't have to do anything to be in that incentive. You just show up and sell a yearling. They're in. And then then the from there on the buyer then has to do the do the stuff to pay in, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So anyway, it seems like well that's that's the easiest thing in the world. Selling yearlings. Well, it's not so much. Because you know, a yearling you got to sell on pedigree, on how they look, and uh, on how well. Ma- so <laughs> I pause there. I've got a uh, some border collies, border collie pups. I've talked about a little bit. And this one, he's pretty wise and darn sure wants to work. This horse that I tied up earlier because he's crabby. He, uh, this border collie was over here staring at him. I turned, that horse, he didn't kick him hard, but he just kicked him right square in the head. And uh, I heard it crack. And I watched him run off. He kind of yiked and ran off and kind of wobbled. But uh, now he, he went over and he got, 
He's over in the ditch there, hiding in the bushes. I can see him. He's not hurt or anything like that, but it's, I wish I'd been smart enough to yell back or something. Yell a, a get back command at him right as it happened, but good lesson for him. Uh, glad to see it didn't hurt him very bad, but good lesson to go get kicked. Like I said, he, he doesn't try to bite these horses or anything, but he just stares at them. And so maybe somebody taught him a little manners there. I'd rather that horse taught him manners than me have to get a hold of him and whip on him, teach him manners. Um, anyway, back to what I was saying with those with those yearling deals. It sounds like the easiest thing in the world, but what's difficult about them is that you can't prove anything about them with the riding. Like, you, you know, if you've got, got a horse that's kind of common headed or something like that, um, but darn sure rides around, you know, or, or the pedigree's just so-so, but darn sure rides around, or you maybe didn't put as much effort into it as you needed to in terms of getting his mane and tail all pretty, but, but darn sure does his job. Um, a lot of people see that. If it's a yearling, you know, you're, you're going purely off of potential. And that can be that can be pretty difficult. So getting a horse fit for a yearling sale, um, there's darn sure there's an art to it. Not everybody in the world. Oh, that pup's got sad. He decided to go home. Hang on. Randy, come here. Come here. He was running home. So we got to talk to him, give him a little confidence back. Oh, horse kick, gosh dang, knock some hide off right on the very tip top of your pointed head, you son of a gun. You don't need to go home. You're all right here. These puppies, I, I think puppies need to spend a lot of time tied up. I haven't tied them up yet this morning, but Maybe what we do a little bit. The little horse kicked you right square on the top of the head. I heard it. Cracked. Heard it crack. Yeah. Maybe you better not stare at horses all the time like you like to. Alright. So hopefully that gave him enough confidence that he won't try to light out. <clears throat> Sometimes these pups get their confidence broke a little bit. Just like a little kid just wants to go to their, you know, go to their room, get under the covers or whatever. That pup thought, well, he was sad and hurt, didn't know why. Thought, well, I'll just go home, lay under the chicken coop. He likes laying under the chicken coop. Anyway, fitting those yearlings is, uh, it's, there's quite an art to it, to have them really popping and really looking their best and it's got a lot to do with nutrition it's got a lot to do with exercise you can't just put them in a stall feed them a bunch of corn get them just gobby fat i mean you can but it's not gonna it's not gonna pay off the way you think it does that uh they don't look as good as as the colt that has been properly fitted. They don't act as good as the colt that's been properly fitted. Uh, it's really not the way to do it. Not to mention, it's darn sure physically tough on them to do that. And so any of you listening to this that done 4-H or FFA, you know what I'm talking about, about fitting. And it's different with steer or hog or something like that. I assume I've never done anything with them, but but what these yearlings need to be properly fitted is not only good nutrition, but they need exercise and, and a regimented exercise, not not just turn them out and let them run around, let them go be a horse. They do need some of that, but regimented exercise that that is uh, you know muscle group specific. 
so that they they are looking feeling smelling like a million bucks and uh, like you 4-H'ers and FFA'ers also know if you got a, a steer that's not quite as good there's certain things you can do to, to hide that well it's the same with horse you know I can I can make one look better than he is so there's there's a lot to fit in those yearlings and another thing that when you when you're trying to sell a yearling like I said potentials all you're selling and so the things that he is good at he better be darn good at for instance as a yearling for the most part I could care less if they're good or bad about their feet depending especially on what part of the world I'm in it's time to tie up those pups because they're they gone traveling um, depending on what part of the world I'm in so like in Arizona I really didn't care what their feet were like or what they were like about picking up the feet they were in the rocks turned out Come on, pups. Come on. One of these days you guys will figure out if you don't go traveling, I won't tie you up all day. Maybe you'll figure it out, maybe you won't. It's funny that one of my sayings has always been that I'm just like darn border collie, I, I need to either be at work or be tied up or else I go chase the neighbor's cows and I've said that for years and it's been a long time since I, I've had a border collie and now I remember where I got that analogy I need to be at work or they need to be tied up or else they go find some work uh, where was that talking about fitting horses oh yeah so like I said you know, in Arizona, I really, I could have cared less how those yearlings were about their feet. Rocks did the work. And then later on, through the starting process, they get good about their feet. It's not something I really worry about a lot. Um, you know, here in Fallon, there aren't any rocks. It's just sand. So, a guy wants those colts to be good about their feet. Uh, but you know honest to god even when they're in the spring when they're growing a lot more foot you know every 10 or 12 weeks is all the more they really need trimmed and most of them you know if, if one if you kind of got to wrestle one a little bit to get the job done that's that's not any, really any big deal by the fifth or sixth time you you've done it then if you do it right then you're not wrestling them anymore and if you're doing it wrong then then they're bad about their feet forever but uh you know in a, in a yearling sale like i said since you're since you're selling potential you darn sure want the the things that you can get trained sure enough trained so they have to be awesome about their feet which is part of the reason I, I don't really focus on their feet that much as youngsters is because it's real hard to train a train a baby about his feet mostly because of the balance it's not so much about about those colts not wanting to let you pick their feet up or touch them you know that's that's relatively easy to easy to do uh, where most of those youngsters are are bad about their feet is because they, they don't feel like they can stand on three feet. And so then they take their foot away and then you're in a wrestling match. Next thing they're scared and, and uh, you know, and then some old, somebody says that grandpa said you got to pick their feet up every day. And well, if you're picking their feet up every day and it's a wrestling match and they're getting scared every day, pretty quick, like, they're pretty darn bad about their feet so um so it's something you've got to 
darn sure do right. Because like I said, that you're selling potential, so the things that you can train, you darn sure want them, want them good. Uh, you know, and then things like getting bathed and, and fly spray and this and that and the other thing. Uh, you know, a horse you can't ride, it's pretty hard to give them a lot of exposure if you don't have a, a really good uh, imagination. It can be real tough to get them a lot of exposure. And so you can have a colt that's just top notch, checked all the boxes, done, done everything. He's looking, feeling, smelling like a million bucks. Got the right mind and everything, but hasn't been anywhere other than the barn, your barn. Well then you put him in a trailer and haul him six hours somewhere and put him someplace he's never been and and uh, new noises and new sounds and new things like that. He's gonna gan up, look like a gutted snowbird for one, and, and he's also you know gonna be losing his mind. And so this really good-minded colt you, you have doesn't show that he's that good-minded. And that costs you money. Uh, and I've seen that seen that happen a lot of times. What, what you'll actually find, those of you that are horse buyers, is that uh, the really bad-minded ones, the ones that that do want to be kind of about half outlaw, they will, uh, they'll get into that new situation and they'll be calm and they'll be quiet and they'll just act like saints. And they'll really act like they're super trainable because they're just falling back on, on the only thing they do have that's, and you know, it's, it's you. And so they, they turn out to be the best ones in those situations. You know, or seem it's they seem really good. I've I've rode a lot of colts that that uh, were the kind that I darn sure chased around the round pen for 20 minutes before I even got on them. Kind of a horse that on sale day I just hawked cinch in them and stepped on and rode them in there. And, you know, they were the kind that didn't move around good. And, you know, didn't have anything good to say about them. And they sold better than the good ones because they just went in there quiet, moved around, did their thing. Where that good one, he got in there and got got scared, wasn't sure what he was supposed to do. And, uh, you know, didn't, didn't look the part that he really was. And, you know, live and learn. That's my fault. So I live and learn. But uh, one of the things I've learned is that <laughs> those bad-minded ones don't get them a bunch of exposure because they'll lean on you on the tough times the good-minded ones need some exposure so like I said if you're not riding them if you don't have real good imagination and quite a bit of sense of humor it's a little tough to to get exposure on them and it you know it seems like the most ridiculous thing in the world to hook the trailer up load 10 head of horses in 10 head of baby colts in there to go grocery shopping but those are the kinds of things that then when you do haul them to the sale put that stress on them they will uh, they'll sure shine because that that being hauled and the traffic and the noise and the heat and the cold or whatever the situation is they've got some exposure to that and so they don't stress as much and uh, you can you can take kind of a middle of the road horse and outshine a, a real high class horse if you do things like that and then there's other types of exposure you know ponying them around and this and that take you know taking pony them on a broke horse and go trot around the ranch across the creek this and that um, may not have a ton of effect on actual sale day but it's going to be something that pays you dividends later because that colt then was 
easy to start and seemed really trainable and etc cetera, etc cetera. so the guy that buys him this year pretty proud of that colt and next year is looking for for one with the same brand on its hip because uh because that one he had did so good for him so there's there's more to fitting those youngsters than just putting them in a stall and feeding them and uh, and a, and a lot more to it a lot more to it than than just putting them in a stall and feeding them you can make a make a break a big big part of that horse's career by how you do that let's just go in here talked about what I'm doing today it's it's uh turned off real cold here the other day while I was gone had a snowstorm I had a snowstorm and the and then wasn't cold enough for that snow to stay on the ground so it melted and then turned cold enough to freeze it before the ground got a chance to soak it all up so the consequence is all my ground's frozen so there's some guys that say well the ground's frozen nothing to do today let's go play pool or something like that like I said I'm kind of like those border collies I either need to be at work or get tied up so here I am Riding around on frozen ground. Well, not only is that dangerous, uh, about everything, well, everything in the barns, barefoot. And so that's, that's tough on these horses too. So I'm just riding everything around in the round pen. Um, while I was talking earlier, that other, other horse, she's, She's pretty tough, so she was kind of the first gunner. And what I did is I, I saddled her and just just worked her around the round pen. I was a foot, just worked around with the buggy whip, let her break the ground up. I'll ride her later. But the rest of these, I'll probably just ride them around here and ride them around and walk for the most part. And there's some that would say that. Ah, oh, you'd better off to have just fed them and gone, gone, played pool. Not in the pool, billiards. I like playing pool. Uh, you know, no sense going out there. I've got my coveralls on. No sense going out there, being cold and humped up all day. But I really feel like, and it's not just because I'm riding mostly young horses, but any horses you know they've had because i was gone they've had thursday friday saturday sunday off and my stalls are big enough that they're they're not it's not like they were all cooped up for four days or anything like that and, and the wife came gave some turnout time and worked a few of them around on the ground i think and said she did anyway guess i believe her so it's not so much it's not so much that i mean to some extent yeah just give them a chance to get out but to, to a big extent, I, I look forward to days like this where we're not loping circles. We're not, I'm not worried about maneuvers or anything like that. I'm just going to get on you and just ride you around quietly and relaxed at a walk. And uh, look forward for, to it for my purpose? No, it's really hard for me. It's really hard for me. But I think it's good for these for these horses to have a day where I don't expect much out of them. I'm, I'm not trying to make them better or faster or anything. It's just this is kind of a kind of a off day for them. You know, if, if you're gonna give them a day off, do it on their back. And so that's that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I think it's mentally really good for them. So. 
hard for me, mentally very difficult, but good for these horses. It's back to talking about fitting yearlings. Um, looks to me like like this opportunity in Texas would be a, a deal where a portion of the year would be dedicated to fitting those yearlings. Uh, like I said, a guy could look at that and go, depending on your mentality, you know, a lazier type of a guy would look at that and go, well, that's awesome. You know, there's, there's a chunk of the year where I don't really have to do much. Uh, a guy that's wired like me goes, well, that's awesome. There's a chunk of the year where there's a whole bunch of the really fundamental important parts of that horse's career that I all I have to do is focus on that uh, I can I can put as much effort as I want into having these horses good on the ground and, and have good ground manners and and fitting them physically and um, fitting them mentally and so it, it's it's actually something that seems kind of exciting to me. There was a time in my life when the maturity level wasn't there for me to see the silver lining, so to speak. Uh, so I, I would have looked at this in my 20s and gone, uh-uh, that ain't going to work for me. I can't, I can't dedicate three or four months of the year to just feeding a horse, just going feed him i can't i can't do that well like i said that the maturity level wasn't there where i i didn't understand didn't understand all the all the good i could get done and, and how fun and exciting that could be you know and of course in those days i didn't i didn't do groundwork <laughs> I, I didn't care about groundwork i just all i wanted to do is be horseback and so there there was a time looking at a deal like like this Texas deal that where I'd, I'd just go, ah, that's a bunch of crap. Y you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't work mentally for me. Uh, at this stage of my life, I look at it and go, well, this is, this is something cool. I can, I can, uh, I can get a lot done doing that and, and kind of a, kind of a mental challenge of how much can I do? How far can I push this envelope? on a yearling what uh what exactly can i do to give myself an edge um because like i said earlier when i was talking that the the mayor program i understand where they're going or, or or why they're doing why they think they need to do what they're doing uh, i think there's a better way to do it that i'll talk about if if anything even comes to this if it comes to fruition and i do some work with these guys and we go to change in the mayor program I'll, I'll talk about why but i think a guy can can accomplish what they're trying to accomplish better faster easier and then not have the the blight black mark whatever you want to say uh, of those foundation genetics on the, on the papers and i'll talk about that for just a second because maybe some people listening you know well, I, really, I really like foundation genetics. Okay, well, that's fine. I like them too. I don't have a problem with foundation genetics. But I'm I'm looking at it from a buyer's point of view. Um, and, and especially a buyer that is wanting to do some competition with these horses. Like I talked about, we're, we're wanting to sell these colts in, um, in sales that have an incentive program. You know, all those incentive programs are based on performance. Whether it's, you know, Clovis, where there's a show at the end and you you win that way. Uh, Ruby Buckle, Brietta Buckle, all of those. Pink Buckle, Purple Buckle, everything like that. It's all, the incentive is all based on, on performance. Um, you know, AQHA has some incentive programs. It's all based on points. And so doesn't matter doesn't matter if you like Hancock horses 
and, and I don't mean Hancock specifically whenever I say foundation, but uh, it doesn't matter if you like Hancock horses, you've got to look at what the competition is. You know, you can be the biggest Hancock fan in the world, and if in the end the competition is uh, cutting a cow, well, you're going to lose to highbrow cats, metallic cats, hashtags, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if in the end the, uh, the competition is roping a full grown cow tied hard and fast and tipping over on the back of her head, now, now, now maybe we want to look at that Hancock horse, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's relative to what the competition is. Um, so I'm not in love with their mare program in terms of, of the relative competition or the relativity towards the competition. Uh, it's doable, but I'm not necessarily in love with it. And so I'm looking at it from a buyer's perspective. If, uh, if Colt from this program with mares that I'm just ho-hum about is for sale and a mare from another program with mares that I'm pretty impressed with, they're at the same sale. Well, obviously I'm gonna I'm gonna look at the that other colt because I like his pedigree better. And so now my thinking is, in that time I have with those yearlings, what can I do to give myself an advantage over that that guy that's got a colt with a more modern pedigree? What can I do? Uh, like I said, I can. I can do some things for exposure so that my, my cold isn't nervous about strange sounds, strange things going on, yada, yada, yada. Okay, I can do that. I can uh, have him better about the things that we can do with yearling. Feet, uh, clip their ears, which I, you know, I hate clipping their ears, but clippers, feet, uh, you know, spray, just overall grooming, just the fact that if that colt just just stands there and takes a grooming, uh, and then how they look, so I can I can fit that horse through exercise and through nutrition. So to me, that's kind of an exciting proposition. Um, you know, later on in that horse's career, once I'm riding the son of a gun. Well, all I can do is ride it, you know, and, and so that's 100% based on on how much talent the horse has and how much talent I have. Well, we'll be realistic. I'm not a magician. You know, I've got talent, what, whatever amount of talent, whatever amount of experience, and whatever amount of work ethic. Well, if the next guy has more of any of those things, he's going to beat me. And, uh, you know, at 40 years old, I, the only thing I can do is, is change my work ethic. The, the amount of talent I have is all I'm ever going to have. The amount of experience I have is all, I'm, all I've got till tomorrow. And uh, so the, the work ethic is the only thing I can improve in me but what I can do is ride a better horse and so you know when it comes down to riding them and training them if that that other guy may not have may or may not have more or less talent ability experience um, and work ethic than I do but if he's riding a substantially better horse than I am or a substantially worse horse than I am well then that's going to be the deciding factor so that's why the, this yearling thing is is kind of exciting because there's uh there's some things I can there's some things I can do with these yearlings to make them more valuable that I can't necessarily do on their back to make them more valuable So that's that, I guess. 
<clears throat> the other part of the program is, of course, whatever colts don't get sold as yearlings, uh, starting them, and then aiming, you know, th these ones we're going to aim at the ranch to get used on the ranch for a couple of years and team roped on in the afternoon and we'll try to mark them as team roping horses and they're five, six, seven years old. These ones, um, because this this outfit does have a uh, some aspirations in the show world. Uh, they've already got some horses in training with some some really really talented trainers, and uh, have had some have had some success in that arena. The, that arena being the literal arena. So, you know, these ones we're going to focus towards the ranch. These ones we're going to focus towards towards training. Um, and so then there's there's the uh, deal you got to think about there. Uh, there's the thing you got to think about there is that that uh, okay is is this horse actually open quality? You know, gonna go to the gonna go to the big trainer in Weatherford. Yeah, that costs I don't know how much actually between fifteen and eighteen hundred dollars a month probably. Um, does this horse actually have the ability to go and, and win? And then if the answer to that is no, like, okay, then what do we do with him now? You know, he's, he's kind of, kind of a better end in terms of, of a horse, but we, uh, you know, we, we almost feel like we're wasting him if we use him on the ranch, but he's he's not quite good enough for for open caliber competition. Well, is he good enough for non-pro? Maybe. Uh, you know, but the the non-pro deal is tough because there's professional non-pros, so they're riding open caliber horses. Uh, they're open caliber riders. They have just never ridden for the public so they're able to keep their non-pro status so your horse has to be good enough to beat them and then then there's the true non-pros that the reason they're non-pro is because they don't have the capability of making a horse and so this has got to be a really good-minded son of a gun that you end up making on on the open level and then competing on on the non-pro level uh, like I said, it can get real complicated real fast. And so a horse that's not, that's not open caliber, that doesn't mean you, that you can go non-pro with him. Like, in fact, it probably doesn't mean that you can go non-pro with him. <coughs> uh, but the open caliber or the open showing world, I guess all the rest of it too, is handicapped. So, um, with the riding horses, you know this one's this one's higher end um, to use on the ranch. Not quite an open horse, but it's handicapped. Well, I'm L1, so I, I'm the the <laughs> I don't know if it's the lowest handicapped or the most handicapped, um, but but I'm I'm the the lowest earnings. I'm in the lowest earnings handicap, um, meaning I don't have to compete with. Corey Cushing. Uh, so there, there's avenues for those horses too, and, and that's depending on on who you are. That can be really tough for for several different reasons. So if you're a guy with really big show aspirations. Um, you're liable to be somebody that that keeps too many of them to try to show like you that would you're liable to be somebody that would keep the ones that were only a little bit better you know and, and say oh this this one's got the potential to be a show horse this one's got the potential to be a show horse uh, when he really doesn't and 
you would also be liable to focus too much on on those L1 horses and and by that I mean if you if you were lucky enough to come across one that that has a potential to show and win in the intermediate or the or the full open with a big name rider that would that would be what's best for the horse program in general you'd be liable to keep it and show it L1 which would be what's best for you but not necessarily what's best for the for the show or for the horse program so that's somebody with with a lot of show aspirations could could potentially fall into into that hazard I on the other hand don't really have that much show aspiration um, I have shown can show do show from time to time but I don't love it and so I could see me falling into a trap where uh, the don't darn sure it's gonna be the best the best go to somebody else let them show the son of a gun but I can see me falling into the trap of uh, yeah this one's a little bit better but but still not quite good enough for me to want to put the effort into to show and then consequently wasting horse flesh in that sense um, and throughout this you know take with a grain of salt what I'm saying about good horse better horse wasting a horse not wasting a horse especially since since I'm throwing the kind of throwing the ranch horses under the bus here I, I don't mean for it to sound that way I I think I think these ranches that are having these guys still ride junk are, are stupid you know a ranch horse is a tool well, you ought to have the best tool you can get you know those those Dewalt impact ranches battery operated impact ranches are the best there is you know if, if you wanted your cowboys to have a have a good impact ranch in the pickup you wouldn't you'd get them a dewalt you wouldn't get them a harbor freight because the, the battery doesn't even last long enough to get a tire off so you know yeah I, I think cowboys should be should be riding really nice horses and so when I say good enough or wasting it whatever uh, that's that's not my personal feelings on how things should be that is my understanding of how the world actually works and and with the the view of doing what's best for the horse program not necessarily what's best for uh, for any one individual horse or human either uh, so that's where I'm in my mind segregating these horses of the ones with more talent if they've got enough talent send them to the send them to the uh, to the show arena and the ones that are kind of just horses send them to the ranch because chances are most of the cowboys are kind of just cowboys uh, you know it's it's not very often where you run across the cow puncher or or cowboy or buckaroo or anything else that has the willingness understanding ability or time to take advantage of of one of those really high class horses you know most of those guys are are better off with just a horse and are, are happier with one anyway uh, so anyway I just wanted to kind of give myself a caveat there. Anybody listening, thinking I'm being disparaging about ranch horses, I'm not. I'm, I'm thinking dollars and cents rather than artwork. So like I say, in the, in the potential situation of having to pick which of these colts goes to the ranch, which of these colts goes to uh, a big name trainer, and which of them I end up keeping and training, and showing some guys would would have to be careful that they were honest with themselves about is this horse really high quality enough to
to show where I'm going to have to be careful that I keep my mindset to where, uh, yeah, Brett, this horse really is good enough for, for an L1 horse. Uh, he really is worth the effort for you to show yada, yada, yada. Cause you know, I know me, I, since I don't particularly want to show, I'm, I'm inclined to pass that off to somebody else. So <clears throat> that's the other, the other part of the job there. Um, besides the yearling operation is in starting all those colts, whatever colts are left and figuring out where they need to go. Figuring out uh, where they go to the show pen, which show pen, under whom, where they go to the ranch, under whom, um, you know, and so then there's a thing too that that a guy has to be aware of, uh, and it's something that, again, in my younger years, I I didn't quite understand, but if you're a If you're picking horses to go to the ranch and, and kind of making the call about who's going to take this 120 ride colt and go on cowboy with him, why you need to you need to be about three quarters psychologist along with everything else, uh, you know, because you've got this guy that's a old school cowboy. That isn't bad to his horses, but they're just a tool to him. You want to kind of go with that that horse that's quieter, not as easily frazzled. You know, something that something that just wants to be a nine to fiver and, and go to work, and, and isn't necessarily even going to have the potential to really turn around, really slide and stop, or something like that. Because you know, because this guy in question is he's the kind of guy that's more inclined to rope one than pen one anyway so so that's where you where you aim it you know the next guy you know sitting in the passenger seat of the pickup he might be the exact opposite uh, you know maybe a guy that spends a lot of time spends a lot of time with these colts nights and weekends and, and uh, read a lot of books watched a bunch of videos and and spent time working for trainers and tries to make something out of his horse and and uh, you know maybe has a mindset like me that takes better cowboy to pin one than to rope one well you know that that colt that's maybe a little bit more fragile minded but it's got a little bit more ability you want to point him that way uh, you know you run across some of these guys and I didn't meet all the guys on the ranch, so I'm, I'm just making conjectures here. But you run across some of these guys that are the kind of guy that uh, has, from time to time, fallen on hard times, whether of their own decision making or not, and, and just had to make it work. And so, so they're the kind of guy that you can mount them on anything under about any circumstances. And, and they'll make it work. Uh, well, that's a handy guy to have around, you know, for sure. But you also kind of got to think about that is that those kind of guys don't ever make one gentle or good to be around necessarily. If the colt's gentle and good to be around, they don't, they don't make them the opposite way, but they don't put any effort into, into making them gentle because they, they can get along with them whether they're gentle or not. Well, there's no resale value in that horse, you know. And so, if this colt's going to go to, you know, Bill. We just made that name up. If Bill's that kind of a guy that can get his job done on anything, it's good to his horses, but never goes out of his way for them. Uh, you know, you think, well, this, this kind of stingy son of a gun. The other guys, I don't think can get along with him, but I think Bill can. But you also have to keep in mind that Bill's not going to make him gentle either. So, so I have to. I have to make him gentle and then send him to Bill. 
all kinds of things to think about. So, like I say, since you have to be about half psychologist, uh, what a guy ends up having to do in this potential situation is, even though I don't necessarily want to go work with these guys and go cowboy and this and that, I mean, I like cowboying, but uh, even though I don't want to put get in that situation where I'm punching cows instead of riding colts, I, I'm going to have to, to some degree, to figure these guys out if I'm going to be the one making the decisions about who gets what colt. Uh, and of course, first year it wouldn't be that. You know, they're, I'd be leaning on, be leaning a lot on other people's opinions. And But after a couple of years and you get guys figured out and, and you can just say, yeah, this, this one will fit Bill, this one will fit Tom, this one will fit Bob. Get them out of here. So there's some other some other parts of the of the job that I had to look at. Um, you big son of a gun. You done running around. Another another potential deal that I may or may not have I don't think I did. May or may not have talked about in the kind of the first segment of this when I was there in the airport. Uh, but I'll talk about it now. Cause it it was darn sure on my mind if even if I didn't say anything about it, is that when you whenever you're riding horses for somebody you're you're playing around with somebody else's hobby and somebody else's emotion and somebody else's feeling of worth uh, and that's that's not so much the case for like what I'm doing right now I'm just riding colts for the public. You bring them 60 days, 90 days, a year, like whatever. I send you the bill, you send me the check. And what I think about the horse isn't really all that relative. Uh, if I really, really like one, I should tell somebody, well, it's a really nice colt. If I really, really don't like one, I will tell someone, hey, I, I'm not sure this is this is what you want to do, this is in your skill set, uh, blah, 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 blah. And, and that's simply because, not that it's altruistic and I'm trying to save lives necessarily, it's, if one's like that, well, I don't want to ride the son of a gun either, so <laughs> I'm trying to talk somebody into, into getting something better to ride. Um, you know, but that's, it's not that big of a deal on, on this situation. It's no different than taking your car to the mechanic. Uh, you know, the mechanic doesn't, he doesn't care if it's a Ford or Chevy or Dodge. He doesn't just care if it's a good one or a bad one. His car's a piece of crap or whatever. He doesn't care. He just fixes it or, you know, does whatever it is you hired him to do. Uh, you know, and like, you might get excited about the fact that holy crap, this thing's got 600,000 miles and it's completely destroyed and it still runs pretty good. Or might get excited about, wow, I got to work on a Porsche today. Which it sounds like working on Porsches is not fun. But maybe for mechanics it is. Anyway, getting in a rabbit hole there. What I mean by all that is that it's different when you're dealing with somebody's horse program, which is what I've spent... The majority of my life doing um, there's a lot of ego involved there there's a lot of uh, emotion involved there and uh, so you have to again be about three-quarters of the way psychiatrist to to uh, figure out how to navigate through that and and move the program along 
improve the program where you can uh, keep it something where you can stand dealing with it and and there again there's ego and emotion involved too on on my part there's also ego ego and emotion involved come on you'll be all right um So you've got, I've got all that to think about. Is this, is the person that's in the end writing the check for the work somebody I can deal with? And, and like I say, with any kind of an empo- employment, that's always the case. But... I think with a lot of other things, and of course this is conjecture because I've never done anything else. I think with a lot of other things, there, there's not quite so much emotion and ego involved um, as there is with hor- horses. Horses make people do dumb stuff. They make people spend spend money that they shouldn't. Um, y- y- you know, get get emotionally attached when they shouldn't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, like I say, I had to spend a lot of time talking with the owner, just talking. If, if you'd have been a fly on the wall, you wouldn't have necessarily thought that we were two guys talking about a, a potentially building and and running a managing a horse program because we spent a lot of time not talking about horses at all Uh, just talking just trying to figure each other out and get to know each other what really impressed me was that in the past that's been something that that I've had to do and steer the conversation around like that so I can figure somebody out um this guy just he kind of started out that way uh which i liked he was trying to figure me out just as much as i was trying to figure him out uh he was thinking the same thing i was thinking there's a lot of emotion a lot of ego involved in horse programs he was thinking about me is this a guy i can stand to have around so there was a lot of a lot of conversation in, in that vein and like i said it, it was it was enjoyable i was i was actually quite pleased with the outcome and it's it's not a matter of oh i like this guy or oh i didn't like this guy i don't have to like somebody to to work with them uh which, to be honest with you i think in a lot of cases you work better with somebody that you don't necessarily like uh I don't think it's a good thing to dislike somebody, but but I think in 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 any industry, I think it's you can get a lot more done if it's not somebody like that you're buds with. So, uh, but it, through the conversation, I, I do like the way this guy thinks. I like the way he maneuvers. Uh, I like that he's not real dead set on things you know he wants to make a plan and pull the trigger on it and if it doesn't work or isn't working he's he's all about changing gears going a different route asking somebody else for advice Um, those are qualities that i that i really enjoy Um, and so then this was another part that that of course i had to really get a feel for anytime you're you're doing something like this you're dealing with with very wealthy people uh simply for no other reason than it costs a lot of money to have a lot of horses and have them in training and be doing stuff with them and it costs a lot of money and there's almost zero chance of actually getting a true return you know i can make a horse program pay but the investment it took to get it to pay 
may not actually ever get paid back. Uh, you know, but anytime you're doing this, you're, you're dealing with people that are wealthy enough that that's discretionary income. It's, it's, uh, it's not that big of a deal. It's more, it's more about the buckle than, than the, uh, than the checkbook. So that's fine. What I found through my career though, working for and with extremely wealthy people it is it depends on where the wealth came from and when <laughs> and uh, you know I've I've worked for people that that didn't personally earn that wealth and had never been not wealthy well it's really hard to convince them they're not not correct about something. You know, if, if something's if something's wrong, it's really hard to change their mind because they've always been in a situation where they could spend their way out of something. They can buy their way out of something that's not working. Where a lot of the rest of us have spent their whole life in a situation. Well, I'll, I'll just use myself for an example my entire life has been a a matter of I, I need to do this right the first time because I can't afford to make a mistake and try it again um, makes me very cautious about what I do and how I do things and uh, sometimes you get two polar opposite ideas like that somebody that's used to being able to buy their way out of a situation and somebody that's used to having to do it right the first time um, they get to button heads it's really really difficult to make things happen I've also worked for people that were extremely wealthy that earned it themselves and uh, some of whom came from very humble beginnings and worked really hard to uh, to get what they've got they can also be a little bit difficult to work for in the sense that they came from very humble beginnings and and worked real hard to worked real hard to make a lot of money and so they're pretty sure they're right about everything because look look what happened turns out they were right well you know you you were darn sure right about the stock market or the oil industry or the this or the that or the other thing but you don't know a damn thing about horses and and so that can be very difficult so uh you know and then I, i'm making much of stereotypical remarks here about about wealthy people but the thing about stereotypes is the reason we have them is because they're correct um but there's there's other people that came from different backgrounds and and came into their wealth uh, under different circumstances or for different reasons um, you know and, and sometimes maybe it was just dumb luck and they can be a lot easier to work with uh, because they have had to work hard they have been in a situation where they needed to do it right the first time and then have gotten to a spot where where they can have this discretionary income to to raise horses and and so you know and maybe they got to that place by being someone that hires good counsel and follows their advice well cool those are the ones that are fun to work for and this guy is the kind of person that uh I think there was some luck involved, but there was also hard work, and there was also, um, I think he owes a lot to good counsel, hiring the right people and taking their advice. Uh, I think that's where a lot of the wealth is owed. And so, seems pretty easy to work with. Uh, seems very interested in 
getting the most the most bang for his buck uh, doing things right the first time uh, and, and looking for looking towards the future looking towards trends when I say the future I, I'm, I mean market trends you know the, the most expensive words in in any industry is that's the way we've always done it but there's there's a lot of horse programs I've been around that that will not upgrade will not go with the flow will not stick with trends um, you know and, and of course there's innovators too you know that don't go with the trend and and knock one out of the park but with these guys that, and gals that just insist on raising the same kind of horse they've been raising for 35 years uh, that's that's very difficult to, to convince them that look I can't I can't raise your average if you won't change your horses you've sold you know in the last 25 years you've sold 700 horses that are just like this that's that's all the market wants is those 700 horses you know and 35 or 40 a year to replace to replace the ones that have gotten old and died um, so so you have to you have to go with what the market wants and sometimes working with with extremely wealthy people that's it's very difficult for them to have perspective um, and it's real easy to get upset with them because they so you know that that's from my part my view of it it's really easy to get upset with these wealthy people because they don't have the perspective um, it, it's it's really easy to get upset that they don't understand well the reason nobody wants to to buy this horse is because the pedigree doesn't look the way it's supposed to and and from a guy that's only got x amount of dollars in his pocket to buy a horse the market shows the trends show that it's 95 percent sure he will get what he's looking for with a specific pedigree and since this horse doesn't have that pedigree even though it has all the other check marks of what he's looking for uh you know he's too scared to spend the money it's hard it's hard to explain that to people because if if you've got the money and it doesn't matter if you screw up uh you know it's hard to give them that perspective so that was one of the things that was on my mind um checking this deal out is is what's this guy like you know what's he going to be like to to be around to work with uh etc cetera, etc cetera. i was like i said I, I went into it with a very cynical mindset purposely um on on that front specifically but uh i, I was pleasantly surprised that he uh He seemed to have a, a good handle on the world. Seemed to understand uh, the difference between the haves and have-nots because he's been have have not. So um, that was a cool thing to look at. A cool thing to see. What else was I talking about that I was going to be looking for? Um, I don't know if I if I made much light about the climate but in the in the equine industry that is something that that does need to be considered is the climate for a variety of reasons one is because you ride horses outside outdoors and so even if you build an indoors to ride the horses in uh I, what i found is that if you have an indoor arena, you'll stay in the indoor arena, and that makes you sick. Just humans need sunlight, period. 
but if you're somewhere that that an indoor or a cover is even considered well that's because the weather is not temperate so how big of a how big of a deal is that going to be um, the reason that the majority of the western horse industry is in california and texas is because the weather's good you know in montana it's cold and snowy um, you know in south florida it's too darn muggy to, to accomplish anything uh yada 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 and so it's it's actually a specific part central and southern california the most temperate part and north central texas is where where the driving force of the of the western horse industry is because of the temperate climate um, and so this deal that i looked at is not north central texas it is south central texas it's pretty darn close to the water to the gulf and so that's a definitely a, a consideration is you know summers are going to be hot and muggy which means you got to get up at midnight to get those horses rode um you know and a guy can say it's not that i can't take it it's that the horses can't take it well, to an extent, that's true. I can take the heat and the muggy and the this and the that and the other thing. Uh, you know, because because humans have will, they have drive, and therefore, too hot, too cold, too anything doesn't exist. Where horses, there's no reason for them to be doing what they're doing, necessarily, that they can come up with. They don't have reason. Uh, and so... When the weather's extremely hot, yeah, you can cause cause some problems there. So there's anyway, I don't know where I'm going with that. Maybe nowhere. So seems to me like I've kind of run out of stuff to talk about so far. So I guess I'll turn this little machine off and if I come up with something else I'll fill you in. And I hope I hope this is something that, that somebody finds interesting. The first experiment with with this where I was just cleaning stalls and doing my morning routine uh, got a lot of positive feedback people really enjoyed it so I thought it would be enjoyable to people to to get walked through the thought process of of looking at a new horse program and figuring out how to build it and uh, so I hope people have enjoyed it if nothing comes of this we'll uh, we'll let you know and if something does come with come from this then uh, there'll be a lot of material to to talk